to live in conformity with nature? O oh, noble Stoics, what fraudulent words. Imagine a being that is like nature, prodigal without measure, indifferent without measure, without intentions nor consideration, without pity nor justice. Uh, so this, the Gay Science was written in 1882, which you know is obviously way before any of the discourses about cybernetics, um, the successful completion of the Human Genome Project, or something like transhumanism. Uh, the analysis between the, of the relationship between the natural and the human in the West has been sustained since early modern times. Uh, so I'm going to cover three topics here. The first is kind of an overview of um, Enlightenment thinking and postmodern thinking. And I think uh, most of the time, in my experience in women's and gender studies, is that the postmodern is where we're pretty seriously situated. But I think it's worth going back over some Enlightenment thinking because it has a direct relationship to some of the forms of scientific reason um, that are still prevalent. Um, so the case could easily be made that humans have always been technological. Uh, the term techni, that is technology, has a long and extended history. Pierre Hadot, in his book Veil of Isis, convincingly describes how nature has been various defined in civilization since the Greek period, almost always set against who and what is considered human. The heritage of these technologies can be found especially in the Enlightenment tradition, which championed the priority of human reason and harbored deep-seated doubts about the world of sensory experience. The dreams of escaping death, escaping the body, and escaping the earth were elaborated in the West as early as the late 17th century. But they were dreams, albeit powerful dreams. Science and scientific thinking are deeply indebted to this tradition, uh, even though the dangers and limitations of science have been demonstrated in the indelible horrors of the Holocaust, Hiroshima, and Chernobyl. In the movement of modernism, um, or Immanuel Kant, as, who was mentioned earlier, history was seen as the, primarily the history of changing ideas. Um, and intellectual history was therefore a found in a progression. Uh, toward greater truth. So life is getting better and better for the modernists and the Enlightenment thinkers. Um, and this is really only possible when science is reflecting a kind of limitless potential. So briefly summarizing Enlightenment thinking, um, it's marked by several key points. Um, I won't go too much into depth if you have questions related to it. So we have a stable, coherent self. There's an I that is you can somehow determine or discover. Um, there are connections between reason and autonomy. In other words, reason brings about freedom in some way. Um, and a teleological plot of history. So again, history is improving as we progress. We're getting better and better, like I said. Um, a very optimistic philosophy of human nature. Um, humans are fundamentally good. And we just need to clear out all of the bad stuff like poverty. And then we'll, and you can see this in Western foreign policy too. We just get rid of all the bad things and the people will inherently be good. Um, and science is an ideal form of knowledge. Humans might not be perfect, the thinking went, but we can make things better. Um, so the subject-object distinction is kind of the place that I want to focus on specifically that comes about in Enlightenment thinking um, and then has, I think, important ramifications for technology and gender. Uh, so the second part of the presentation is a focus on Donna Haraway and Catherine Hales, who published a lot of material in late 80s, kind of 1990s and early 2000s. Um, Donna Haraway used the metaphor of the cyborg in her publications, though she has since disavowed the cyborg as a model of the integration of the human and machine, this model still provides helpful analyses of the ways in which gender can be imagined, giving advancements of technology. Haraway critiques the deceptive concept of the body's naturalism. Uh, again, this was a premise of Enlightenment thinking, that the body was something natural versus uh, reason, which was something different. Um, body, like deconstructionists have suggested, is not prior to social interaction, but rather is a product of language and society. The body exists in a quasi-symbiotic relationship and a hybridization of subject-object distinctions. Catherine Hales has similarly mapped new te territories regarding technology and gender. She, like Haraway, finds the figure of the cyborg appealing to describe the potential for a change in discourse. For her, this change is to move away from rebirth into regeneration. Hale states that she discovered in cybernetics that, quote, the model that seemed more fully able to account for the complexities of human being had lost out to a simpler and less adequate model. So the simpler model has been found, according to her, in the more modern and recent technologies, uh, which I'll talk more about. Um, the other main argument Hales makes about early cybernetics has to do with the way in which it attempted to find a common language to describe both mechanical as well as organic systems. 
thereby blurring the distinction between the human and the technological, and then sort of splicing them back together. Um, in both Haraway and Hales, science is intimately connected to both the birth and the death of the subject. Um, so the idea of escaping the body is, changes the condition of both birth and death, in other words. Um, it also changes subject-object categories in, in terms of postmodern thought. Uh, the stable unified self that I talked about before has been replaced um, either basically by a, a simplified account of what the human being is. Uh, the conclusion both Fairway and Hales draw from this analysis is that the emergence of postmodern technoculture and the prominent role in tropes of disembodiment within that culture requires a new way of talking about the body, responsive to its construction and not trapped within it. Um, one of the great accomplishments of both Haraway's and Hales's work is the new vocabulary that they provide for talking about this problem. Um, so the second part of my paper is focused on continental philosophy. Um, that's kind of my stronger background. So while feminist discourses regarding the technology of science began almost two decades ago, there's been little scholarship connecting these ventures with similar projects in continental philosophy, beginning most clearly with Martin Heidegger's work, but continuing through Michelle Serra, <coughs> George O'Gombin, among others. While not explicitly bringing gender into the forefront, continental theorists have suggested a wide range of possible alternatives that destabilize the subject, at times even destroying the subject completely. Martin Heidegger, uh, in his magnum opus, Being in Time, challenges this typical Enlightenment thinking. Uh, Nietzsche was sort of the predecessor for all of this thought, and Heidegger follows him very closely in some ways. Um, Enlightenment thinking regarding the place of experience for Dasein. So Dasein for Heidegger, roughly equivalent to a human being. He goes off into very dense philosophical discussions about it, uh, which I will not repeat. So for Heidegger, the world of Dasein is first experienced effectively um, before any conscious organizations of selfhood. So we live in a world that is ontologically, at the very heart of it, marked by sense experience. That is the most primary mode that we understand. Before any ideas of thought or reason or anything like that, those are secondary for Heidegger. Uh, the more recent French philosopher, Michel Serre, has also tackled the topic of binary oppositions through his figures of the Harlequin and the Troubadour. Um, in his work, the Harlequin is a figure positioned between male and female, similar to Haraway's cyborg. He describes the Harlequin as a figure who escapes gender, quote, so that it's impossible to locate the vicinities, the places, or borders where the sexes stop and begin. A male lost in a female, a female mixed with a male, end quote. Uh, and I should also note here, Haraway has a, I'm sorry, Hales has a very interesting article on Michelle Serre. So it's not that these connections don't exist, I just haven't seen them more recently. Um, Serre sees gender as one of the categories affected by the changes in technology. Um, a lot of the time in his work, he's investigating the sciences. He uses a lot of very creative ways of writing um, that are not necessarily very direct. So there's interdependency in the natural world um, and the human world that, according to his reading, has been always in play and is now emerging um, as nature becomes increasingly affected by human actions. And this is also a really important point for one of Heidegger's students, Hans Jonas. Um, he talks very articulately about the threat to the environment to what we used to think of as the natural world. So where before, he says, um, there were the idea of the city of man was set against nature outside. But he says the city has basically overwhelmed every idea that we have of nature. We have, uh, in Derrida's words, there's this global Latinization. Our technologies have become increasingly uh, complicated, but also more powerful. At the same time, we don't have the ability to predict the ends of our actions to the same degree. So, Something like, um, not even this human genome project, something like genetically modified crops. We have this massive potential for change. Um, the idea is that, again, it's going to get better and better. We're going to be able to provide more crops for people who are hungry. Uh, but the reality is that we don't really have a whole lot of information about what's going to happen 20 years down the road. And that's what he means by the predictive abilities, kind of exceed our ability to act. Um, and he's not talking just about something like nuclear weapons. He's also talking about things that create what he calls existential impoverishment. Um, and Derrida here also has some interesting things to say. Um, he has a book, excuse me, called The Gift of Death. And the idea is that death is that which defines human existence. And that's changing with new technologies. Um, there are philosophers like Ray Kurzweil, uh, he calls himself a futurist, who talks about downloading the content of your brain. 
being able to plug it in somewhere um, and thus escape our body. And this has really clear correlations with, um, with feminist theory because, of course, the body has always been seen as the purview of the female. So I think these, these projects are on different registers, but they have a lot of interconnections that I find really fascinating. Um, so in summary, continental philosophy can be seen to be undertaking a similar project as feminist discourse surrounding the post-human. Um, both areas are fundamentally concerned with the way that bodies have been included by discourse, and both also problematize the common cultural divisions. These projects are founded on a refusal to describe reason and division from the physical world as being the true human condition. So that's another question. What, what's the relationship between the world, however we conceive it, um, and the human? Where, does, where do we cease to be, and where does the environment start to uh, become more visible? And some people say that that doesn't exist. We are natural creatures, um, and the natural environment is just an extension. So the projects in general, though, of continental philosophy are founded on a refusal to describe reason and division from the physical world. Um, as human beings, we are dwelling on the earth. This is an important time uh, term for Heidegger. He talks about the dwelling. Um, it has a very different idea of what that means. Uh, an important part of our dwelling is the environment and our embodiment. Um, so the contrast that I see between feminist theory of science, the heroin heels that I mentioned earlier, um, and the continental theory is that the feminist philosophy of science is more about a blending of categories uh, so that discourse emerges from this, what, splicing effectively. Um, the idea of the human and the machine blending together in some way. Um, but continental theory seems in general, and so, again these are both generalizations, seems to be a lot more concerned about the problems that emerge with technology. Um, so Haraway and Hale seem pretty optimistic about what the cyborg can represent for gender studies. Um, and Heidegger, and the thinkers I mentioned, are very concerned about dissolving physical nature. There are circumstances that, um, that really are difficult for us to comprehend at this point, they say. Um, so long-standing debates in feminist philosophy of science can be augmented by this infusion of continental theory. Um, but the, the remaining questions, and this is something that I, I think about a lot, is basically, do, do these technologies that we're talking about, um, do they help us or hurt us, and how are we to determine this? Thank you.